good morning, church. It's so great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Come on, can we stand to our feet? We're going to get started with a time of worship. Let's put our hands together. Come on, sing Faith Awaken. Faith Awaken, breathe into me. Bones were shaking. The blood you shed was mercy saving. A dying world. every burden aside. Come on, church. Let's sing these words out together. I can't go back to the beginning. I can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here the place where you promised to be. Come on, every voice in this place, we lift this up this morning. Make this our prayer. Not enough unless you come where you meet me here again. Because all I want is all you
your praises this morning.
with that. Try to find Pastor Aaron Crane. It was his decision, his fault. I uh, just take all your complaints right to him. No, we apologize. The, uh, the flooring out in the lobby is at a stage where if we spill the coffee, it'll be there permanently. So we had to take it out. And so if you're grumpy, Andy will make you happy when he comes up and speaks this morning, but uh, just don't be grumpy at him. So watch your face, okay? We're glad that you're here this morning. If you're new with us, we don't know who you are yet, we wanna invite you to do something. Whether you're here or online and you're new, we want you to text the word new to 951-425-4425. Let us treat you to Starbucks this week, as well as let you know some things that are happening here around Cornerstone. Like, ladies, there's an event coming up in October, a big women's event with a comedian, and this is a great opportunity for you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your family members to come and be a part of something at Cornerstone that just kind of introduces them to who we are. So it's promised to be a great night. You can text the word women to our church number and you can register at that time. Maybe you're ready for your next step. You say, I've been coming to Cornerstone. What do I do next? What's happening next? Let me give you three possibilities for you. The first is this. Maybe it's time for you to be baptized. You've come to know the Lord as your Savior, and your next step is to publicly declare that. And so baptism is happening next Sunday. Pastor Andy will be doing the baptisms right here during each service. So if you would like to be baptized, just text the word baptism to our number. You can register that way. Invite your family and friends and come celebrate that with us during each service next week. Or maybe you're ready to get in community together, meet some new people, and get involved in a life group. If that's you today out on the patio, our Life Groups team is out there. They can tell you when they meet, where they meet, what they're studying, all that kind of thing. But this is a brand new fall launch. And so this is a perfect time to get involved. So you can text the word group to our church number or go see them today and find a group to plug into. Or a third next step for you might be discovering your gift. If I was to give you a birthday gift and it was all wrapped and you just held on to it and never unwrapped it, you would disappoint me and you would be disappointed as well. Well, God has given each and every one of us a gift and it's time to unwrap those. So if you don't know your spiritual gift, your purpose, the plan for why you exist, then join me next week, Sunday, 1130. We'll be in the Next Step Center and we're gonna have a gift discovery class. So you can text the word gift to that number, register for it, come and join us 1130 next week. If you missed any of that information, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. And all the information is there by QR code or by numbers that you might, you might need. This is a time of our, of our giving. We transition and say, let's really thank God for what he's done in our life and the sacrifice that he has made and allow us to respond in such a way that whatever we've got, he's given to us anyway and he asks us to give in such a way that we acknowledge what he's done for us. So many of you are faithful and generous givers. Some of you have not taken that step in your journey of being a faithful giver. And so we invite you to do that. You can do that by text. You can go online. You can utilize the offering boxes around the campus. But we all try to work together to say, you know what? This is our church. This is our community. We want to give back to God so that ministry happens and a difference is made around the world. So I want to pray for you. If you would, bow your heads with me. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for all that you've done in our life. We give back to you now with faithful, generous, and happy hearts, knowing that you will bless it and use it for the sake of the kingdom. And so to that end, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Sorry if I was a little slow getting up here. There's no coffee today. That doesn't make any sense, no. Uh, the other option we could have is we could have coffee, spill it all over the place, and then put the sealer over it. And just remember, this is a caffeine-addicted church in Christ. 
And we will know that forever because it'll be there. So we had two options, but we didn't choose that one. But so pray this week we get done with that because we can't have two weeks in a row of no coffee. All right, we're in the middle of our Life in Him series. We have a couple chapters left in the Gospel of John. Jesus has been arrested, mistreated, had a mock trial. He's with Pilate, and Pilate is, is recognizing that Jesus is innocent, but then has all this pressure from the crowd, and he's trying to figure out how to let Jesus go. We end up seeing that he is weak and lacks integrity, and so even though he knows Jesus is innocent, he'll turn him over to be crucified. Jesus is crucified for our sins in this chapter. It's, it's one of the most important chapters in the Bible. And yet, Jesus is fearless. He's courageous, and he's in complete control, I believe, because he, he came out of a time of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, ready to face the cross. And so we see a courageous Christ here in this moment. But it's going to have the appearance of loss, of, of weakness, as Jesus is hanging on the cross. And yet... That is God's greatest moment of victory in all mankind, in all, in all of history. But we are so far removed from the cross that we, we just forget what it's all about. We have, um, we have it on you know, bracelets and necklaces, and that's fine. I think they look adorable on my daughter, and I, and I think they mean, hey, I love Jesus, and that's good. But not in that time, not in that time period. It was gruesome in that time period. Let's read what a first century Roman statesman, Cicero, said about the crucifixion, something that you wouldn't even talk about in polite society. He said, it is a crime to bind a Roman citizen, to scourge him as an act of wickedness, to execute him as almost murder. What shall I say of crucifying him? An act so abominable, it is impossible to find any word to adequately express it. It would just be, would be unheard of that that would ever happen to a Roman, no matter what they committed. And yet, this is the way that Jesus was going to die. This was the plan that he would be pierced, prophecy saying that he's going to die in this particular way. Why? Well, we're going to talk about that today. The scriptures we look at today remind us that Jesus dying on the cross should be thought of today and embraced by us and change us today. There should be an effect on our lives because of the crucifixion. Now, as I'm reading John chapter 19, you're gonna hear the word fulfilled uh, used in the scriptures, reminding us that what is happening on this day was prophesied in the Old Testament. In fact, there are 28 Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled on the day of the crucifixion. And if you read them, they build your faith because many of these were written hundreds, if not a thousand or so years before the time of Jesus. And so you can go to go to cornerstone.com slash 28 and you'll see the Old Testament prophecy with the New Testament fulfillment, all of these fulfilled on the day of the crucifixion. And so as we read this account, the main thing that should jump out at us as we're reading this is, is the horror of the crucifixion and the love of God that allowed Jesus to do this for us. John chapter 19, verse one says, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, hail, king of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace and said, where do you come from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Do you, do you not realize that I have the power to either to free you or crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. And Pilate brought Jesus out and sat down at the judge's seat. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. So Pilate handed them over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his cross. He went out to the place of the skull, and there they crucified him, and with him two others. 
Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The chief priests and the Jews protested to Pilate, saying, don't write the King of the Jews, but this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, and with the undergarment remaining, they said, let's not tear it, let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said they divided my clothes among them and cast lot for my garments. When Jesus saw his mother there and a disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son and to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything that had been finished so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And in verse 38, we see Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. And he was accompanied by Nicodemus and taking the body, the two of them wrapped it with spices. And at the, palace, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And they laid Jesus there. So we read this story, we realize how could... How could Jesus allow himself as the son of God to be abused like this, to be hurt like this, to be, to be made fun of so much? The, the, the pain in this story is we are, it's unrelatable to us today. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what does the cross mean to believers today? Like, what does it actually mean to me 2,000 years later? What difference should it make in my life? And we're gonna look at scriptures that speak of the cross that answer that question for us so we can embrace the cross today knowing that it will change our lives. Because the cross means, the first thing we think of, that Jesus loves us and is committed to us. Or else why would he endure this and not just like short circuit the whole thing? In Hebrews 12, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God? Why did Jesus endure such brutality and not put an end to it earlier? Well, we're told something that we can't read in John chapter 19, that there was this internal joy in his mind as he was completing this. Not that it was fun, obviously, but he knew that he was fulfilling the Father's will, that he was rescuing mankind and saw forward even to today that, that people sitting in this room today could believe and be forgiven of their sins because of what he was about to do on the cross. And so there was, there was joy in his heart at moments as he realized all the people that would be loved by the Father because of what he was accomplishing. And so he loves us, but he's committed to us. If the Father has already sent the Son to die on the cross, what isn't he gonna do for us to help us accomplish his purposes? to remind us of his love. He's going to do many lesser things to help us. Almost everything we pray for is a lesser thing than the crucifixion. And God is committed to us. Love rescues those that are loved. I think it was three weeks ago that I was out uh, checking the mail and uh, a neighbor farther down the road said, hey, pastor, pastor, come here. What, what time are the services? Come here. What are the, and I was like, oh, this is exciting. He's asking about the church services. And so I walk over to his house, and before I know it, I'm moving a piano. <laughs> and I was like, I, I, I don't know if I can do this. And, and, and I, 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 try, I moved the piano. The next day, I was playing basketball here, and my first jump shot, just a jump shot, I landed and my back went out. And every time I bent down, it took me like a minute to get up. But I played three more games because I'm a fool, and we won, and so it was worth it. Two days later, horrible sciatica pain came for the first time in my life. I had to go to the hospital. <laughs> but only for four hours, and it doesn't count if you're not admitted. We can all agree upon that, right? So we don't have to worry about this. It was a cornerstone nurse that gave me the medicine. I had to get like a Toradol shot in my arm. It was 10 out of 10 pain for the first time in my life. And I told her, I said, listen, I don't know if I'm gonna tell the church about this for my reputation's sake. She goes, oh, it's okay, legally I can't say anything. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, the privacy laws are great, right? So anyway, I have to have an MRI and um, I'm, I'm being slid into this torture tube 
And I marked on there no claustrophobia because I've had two other MRIs. And as I'm in there, I was like, I don't have a game plan for this. And I'm like, I can't get out of here. This is crazy. And so I got the little thing where you're supposed to squeeze it. I'm like, no, I can do this. I can do this. And so finally they pull me out and I'm like, yes, the Lord like sped up time. That was, there's no way that was 18 minutes. This is great. And he said, it wasn't 18 minutes. That was five minutes. Remember that plastic belt we said was fine? It's not fine. We got to put you in a gown and start over. And I, when I asked him how long the whole thing would be, I was like, and none of that counted? I was like, I'm not doing, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I was like, that is just a horrible feeling. Why would I do that? It makes no sense. And I said to him, if my children were trapped in dozens of MRI tubes, I would go in there and get them, but I'm not going in there. I feel fine today. I don't feel any pain today. I'm going, I'm going home. I ended up scheduling an open MRI, which is a much better experience. But listen, I wouldn't think twice to go rescue my kid. It's the greatest a statement of love you could make is I would go through dozens of MRI tubes for you, child, right? Um, listen, love rescues. And so Jesus loves us. That's why he endured the cross. He's committed to us finishing this journey with him. He's gonna finish the work that he started. But the cross also means if we're loved so much, in response, we have to stop loving the world so much. Right, we have to. In Galatians 6, it says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, the word world there doesn't mean uh, the, the many people that are out there that Jesus died for and loves. It doesn't mean earth in the sense of nature. It, it means wor world in a technical sense from the Bible, that which is in sinful rebellion against God and trying to sway humanity to rebel against God, that which is anti-Christ against his kingdom and his ways, drawing us to focus not on God and his kingdom and the lost, but on, on fame and getting rich quick and, and you know the things of this world, lust and, and pride. The world is against God and sometimes it has a pull on our hearts and if we're honest, we, we kind of love parts of the world that are against God. Plenty of neutral, great things about the world to love, but when my heart is being pulled towards that which is against God, I know that I need to spend some more time thinking and being grateful of, of the cross and what Jesus is actually accomplishing. And then, then the world has less of a pull on me as I spend time thinking about the love of God and what he did on the cross, my mind reprioritizes and I realize, no, there's a mission here on earth it's not about my world and what I want to do and my selfishness. It's about God's kingdom. And I, and I can realize that as I remember this huge moment on earth that Jesus died for our sins. It's going to mean that we fall more and more in love with him and less with this sinful world. Now, the cross also means that our debt that we have for sin has been paid. And, and this is amazing. In Colossians, it says that God forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. He stood against us, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. As we go through life, we are accruing this debt that we owe to God with our sin. It needs to be paid for but we can't pay for it. We can't be good enough. We can't apologize enough to do anything about it. And the wages of sin, what we deserve for our, our debt is death. And that debt has been paid. Our account has been wiped clean with God. When the Father looks at us, he doesn't think about all the past sins. Jesus took that and paid for it with his blood. And he takes our sins and he, and he puts it as far as the east is from the west and buries it under the deepest part of the sea. Jesus paid it all. I think it was in 1865 that that hymn, Jesus Paid It All, was thought of. I love the story of how it was thought of. Elvina Hall in Maryland was listening. She's sitting in the choir, listening to the pastor pray for like the longest prayer ever. And then he goes into the longest sermon ever. But remember, she's in the choir loft, so she's facing everyone. So she's got to fake it till she makes it, right? And so she's, but then eventually she's daydreaming, which is happening right now for us some. That's okay. It's, a, it's in the story I'm telling. And she's daydreaming and she comes up with this great poem. And so she writes it down. After the service, she shows it to the pastor. She confesses her sin. I wasn't listening to a word you said, but look at this poem. 
And the organist, John Grape, at the same time had just finished composing a new song. And the pastor looked at it and said, hey, work together and put this together. And Jesus paid it all. This beautiful hymn was, was created. The, part of the lyrics are, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It, it launched as fullness in Christ was the name of it and later is known as Jesus paid it all. We don't have a debt anymore with God. Here's the cool thing. We don't worry about debts that have been paid, right? It doesn't make any sense to worry about them. Now we worry about debts that we have and we think, man, how do I, how do, I do this? I gotta keep working and get more money and pay off this debt. So I think it was a year or two ago that I, I finally had enough money to pay off my college debt and I've been paying this thing for like 15, 17 years, since 2004. And I was like, you know, I, I can pay this off. But then rumors were circulating that maybe debt would be canceled. And I was like, you know, this debt has weighed on me since 2004. I'm going to pay it off and I'll rejoice with those in the future that get, it, that get it wiped away. And I'm trying to stay committed to that joy for others as it's wiped away. But I'll tell you what, having a year, you don't believe me at all. <laughs> having, I'm trying to believe myself. Having a year of not having to worry about that debt, it feels great, and, and it was worth it, right? Andy, it was worth it to pay it off myself there. I don't have, you don't think about the debt. And so stop worrying about your past mistakes. Stop worrying about your past sin. The guilt that you're feeling is from the enemy. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus paid it all. And the cross means that we will not experience God's wrath towards sin because that debt's been paid. And so there was gonna, gonna be wrath towards sin, right? Sin is sinful rebellion against God, even though we try and label it in a bunch of different cute categories and try, oh, it's just a mistake, it was just, a, it's rebellion against the created order that God made. And, and God has to crush sin to be faithful and just. And that was what was awaiting us punishment and pain, but Jesus paid that for us. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross. And, he, and he's kind of quoting from Isaiah 53 there, which says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him, listen, punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Jesus took all of that for us. The worst moment for Jesus was when the wrath of God was poured out on him, not when the nails were piercing his hands. When the wrath of God was poured out on him, that was the worst moment. Not experiencing the love of the Father, but the wrath of the Father towards sin, the greatest act of love we could imagine. We, won't, we don't have to fear that. It's not in our future as a Christ follower because our debt's been paid, so we won't experience the wrath of God towards sin. What a blessing. And the cross means that sin no longer rules us because we've been set free. I mean, I, I, most of us have experienced at some point the, the bondage of sin, right? We're just stuck. We just can't stop the way we treat people, the, the, the words that we say that are, that are harmful and breaking relationships, whatever it is. We're stuck, we're caught in sin, it owns us. Romans 6 says, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. The death of our old self is an established fact. And so we don't have to battle our old self and our old desires, although that's what it feels like, right? We're like, ah, I used to do this, I wanna do this again, and we're battling it. No, we just need to reckon it dead. The old man is dead, our old self is gone. We were made a new creation and, and the key has been turned in the cage that has been holding us. The door is wide open if we're willing to step forward. We don't do that all at once when we give our lives to Jesus. Sometimes it takes time. And so there's hope in the gospel that we don't have to stay the same way. I've felt a few times at life the, the bondage of something that has held me or, or an addiction. And for me, when I went to go study abroad in Florence, Italy, I didn't just bring back an amazing love for pizza and pasta. Everybody in Italy was smoking cigarettes. And so I was like, well, it's a part of the culture. I got to start smoking cigarettes for the first time in my life, right? I just won't do that when I'm back in New York City. Well, uh, all of my roommates also studied abroad that semester and they all came back smoking cigarettes. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to be the first to quit. So I put a cigarette on the table and I stared at it for six hours, trying to decide if I really wanted to do this. 
And I decided, no, I do not want to do this. And I was freaking my roommates out. They're like, just stop staring at the cigarette. You're making us feel bad. And so I just kept on smoking because I couldn't stop. I just couldn't stop doing it. And it felt good and I enjoyed it. And then one day, the Lord was working on my heart and giving me more strength. And I was thinking of that, that verse in, in Romans that says, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial but I do not want to be mastered by anything. And I'm like, I'm mastered by this. This thing owns me. And I remember sitting in, in Manhattan and I'm filling out an application to go on my first missions trip ever. And I'm so excited. I'm like, this is great. I'm smoking a cigarette, filling out the application to go on a missions trip. And on the application, it says, do you smoke? And I'm like, well, they sure phrase that in a negative way. And I didn't know how they were gonna respond. They probably were gonna say like, oh, don't smoke in people's houses or at church and like, and, but I was like, well, man, they're sure, I'm feeling all this condemnation from just a, do you smoke? And I was like, well, I really wanna go on this missions trip. Maybe this won't let me go on it. So, so I finished my pack of cigarettes and then I wrote no, and I never smoked ever again in my life. And I, now you almost feel bad clapping, don't you? Because it was deceptive. <laughs> mildly deceptive. Now, to the letter of the law, I was accurate. From that moment forward, I never smoked again. Ten years later, I told the missions pastor, and he said I was an idiot. <laughs> and he was right in declaring me that. But listen, it, it had a hold of me. And, and, and the Lord gave me the strength to say, no, I was like, no, I want to be something different now. I want, to, I, want to, I want to live differently. Think of the Egyptians. This is a bit of a morbid example, but the, think of the Israelites in slavery to Egypt for 400 years. And then God sets them free. Ten plagues, they're led away. The Red Sea is parted. The Israelites are going through. The Egyptians change their mind about letting them go. And they chase them. And once all the Israelites are safe on land, God slams the seas down. And Pharaoh and the, and the Egyptian army are destroyed. But there was 400 years of slavery. And here's the morbid part, so forgive me for this, but there's gotta be a point where an Egyptian body washes up on shore and doesn't frighten them anymore. Every Egyptian before that would have frightened them because those Egyptians had power over them. But dead, there's no power. Our old man is dead. It's been crucified with Christ. The cage has been opened. We need to step forward and say, sin does not rule me anymore. And the cross also means, and this is exciting, that Jesus lives in us and wants to live through us. And so we don't live alone anymore. God is with us. He dwells with us. In Galatians, it says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Through the Holy Spirit, each of us have a relationship with Jesus. And so no wonder we start to have different desires, right? Instead of just desiring that which is against God, now we say, well, I kind of want to help this person. I want to serve the Lord over here. I want to do, that's Jesus living inside of us saying, there's work to be done in my kingdom. Let's go do it together. He pours his life out to us as we are a branch connected to the vine. His nourishment, his love, his desires, his ideas flow through us. And now we live with him. And the power of Jesus is now there to help us overcome sin, be courageous, and share our faith. Because Jesus wants to do the Father's will through my life now. And so when he notices something through my eyes, he wants to serve. God is with us. And the cross also means, this is a harder one, we're expected to pick up a lesser cross. Not crucifixion, although that has happened as many saints have been persecuted in that exact way. We're expected to pick up a much lesser cross and bear it. Jesus said this, it, it still was powerful because many crucifixions were happening at the time before his. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Wow, Jesus likened discipleship with the horror of crucifixion. Now, sometimes we... We think of taking up our cross as, oh, well, I've got like a difficulty in life or a trouble or a trial. And if I just kind of get past that and have some endurance, that's my cross. Not really when you think about what the cross was in Jesus' day. When somebody picked up a cross in Jesus' day, like Jesus had to carry a portion of his cross that was then connected and he was nailed to it, it meant certain death. You picked up the cross to die, not to be let go after, after some suffering. And so 20 centuries later, we've really sanitized our view of the cross, but a more modern way to say it would be if Jesus said, walk down death row daily. 
die to yourself. For the Christian, picking up the cross is dying to ourself, our selfishness, our desires, our vision and dream for our life and saying, no, I have resurrection life in Christ. I'm going to serve him and be a part of his kingdom and value what he thinks above my desires that are contrary to him. And so where my heart and dreams are in alignment to God, and I'm excited about it just as much as God is, he blesses it, but where my heart and dreams are contrary to God, I die to myself and I say, nope, even though I can't see this life being as joyful as the one I was gonna choose, I have resurrection life in Jesus to walk in his ways and be a part of his kingdom and watch what he will do. And so the cross means we have to pick up a lesser cross, but God's gonna give us the strength to do that. And it also means that we should humble ourselves and serve others. When the apostle Paul was trying to convince us of humility, he said this in Philippians 2, in humility, value others above yourselves and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on a cross. It's supposed to be like a mind-blowing statement saying, Paul's like, would you be humble? And keep in mind, Jesus left paradise, embraced humanity, and was mocked and beaten and made fun of and slapped and crucified. What service is really below me? How prideful can I really be when Jesus did that for me? And so I like to think that I'm husband of the year. It's kind of bad to say that on, isn't today like wife appreciation day? It's, it's like a new holiday they're trying to make money on. But if that's a real thing, somebody tell me after service, and sweetie, you, I am doing the dishes today, all right? But I like to think I'm husband of the year. If, if it's a full moon, the stars have aligned, I've already watched my favorite TV show, I've had a good dinner, and I snuck some ice cream without the kids noticing, and then I have this idea, I should do the dishes. And I walk over there thinking, <laughs> I do them real loud, so Shannon hears, so banging things around, right? Hey, no problem, just doing the dishes, because everything lined up perfectly, so I can do that. But on days where I'm exhausted and I feel like I've served my family enough and I've served the, served the Lord enough and I sit down on the couch and I'm looking for the remote and Shannon just casually walks by, oh, honey, can you do the dishes? <sighs> the disrespect. I mean, I have been serving the family. I can list, I start listing off all the things in my mind I've done. I'm a servant of God, right? I've been serving the kingdom today. And, I, and even if I do, do the dishes, I'm like, Ugh. I still do them loud, you know, all grumpy, you know, but I get no reward in that. What do I think is below me when Jesus went to the cross? I need to embrace humility and recognize that just like God has revealed himself to be a servant, I need to become a servant and a servant that doesn't complain. The cross means that nothing is more important than Jesus. That's our takeaway for today. Nothing is more important than Jesus and what he did for us. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul said, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The great missionary and church planner, when he would go and be among you know, people that were being converted to Christianity or when he would visit a church that he had already established, he said, my goal is to talk about Jesus and the cross. When Paul wanted to encourage people, he spoke of Jesus. And we live in a world where the stats on anxiety, discouragement, despair, stress, everything, it's going through the roof. And we need to speak Jesus to the people around us. We need to embrace them and remind them of the love of God. And we need to come alongside them and say, I'm gonna walk this with you. I'm gonna bear this burden with you and help you as you're struggling. Because that's what Jesus would do. It blew my mind uh, this week when a, a family came over and we were having a good meal together and um, the kids were in the pool. And I heard this story where a mom talked about her second grade son, who I think is seven years old, came home from school and said, mom, I told this kid in my class, do you know God? Do you wanna know about God? And he goes, yeah, I wanna know about God. Sure, I don't really know much about God. Yes, yeah, what do you know about God? And he goes, all right, I'll, I'll talk to my mom. And he goes home and says, mom, would you put a Bible verse, a different Bible verse in my lunch every day so that I can read it to my friend and teach him about God? A seven-year-old is saying this and his friend's on board. You're thinking like, what life am I missing that I'm not embracing this model and this appreciation that his kid has? Like a second grader, talk about humility. It's challenging. 
when you realize there's a kid who says, well, I'm being raised in a family that says Jesus is the most important thing. My friend here doesn't know about Jesus, so if it's the most important thing, I better tell him about Jesus. Couldn't be more true. That is more true of a way to live for Christ than it is to say, oh, they don't wanna hear it. They don't wanna hear it. I don't wanna bother them. I don't wanna be a pain. I don't wanna be a zealot. No, he's discovered the truth, the importance of speaking of Jesus because of what Jesus has done for us. And finally, the cross means nothing unless you are being saved by it. It doesn't make any sense. Coming here on a Sunday, even like listening to the words of the songs, you're like, I don't, why are people doing that? Like, why are people getting emotional about this invisible God? It doesn't make sense unless you're being saved by it. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It doesn't make any sense to some people because they're living in the natural world and they have not yet been born again of the Spirit. There's no supernatural part touching their heart yet. And so until we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, none of this makes any sense. And so God is drawing us to himself. The Holy Spirit is convicting us of our lifestyles and sin. And people need to hear about how important Jesus is and the rescue plan that he has, or else this means nothing to them. And there may be some here today that uh, respectfully and out of love for your family, you say, I, I come to church for my family, but I don't really believe this. Well, uh, uh, that's actually a pretty cool thing to do to say, I, I recognize this is important to my spouse and my kids, and so I'm here. That's respectful. And maybe you even feel like this whole thing is foolishness. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe you've been visiting Cornerstone for a while, trying to figure out Jesus. And through our studies, you've realized Jesus is the Son of God, the creator of the world. And yet God loved us so much that he would die on the cross for our sins so that I don't have to experience the wrath of God against my sin. Maybe you didn't realize how big of a deal your sin was to God. And you've discovered that by listening to the Gospel of John, by talking to your friends, by reading the Bible by yourself. I believe this is the most important decision anyone could ever make to follow Jesus Christ. When I was not following Jesus Christ, I thought satisfaction would come as I pursued worldly things. And so I was chasing after girls, trying to get wasted, and just thinking, this is the life, the party life. And yet I knew deep in my heart that it did not satisfy me. It was empty. And you have to ask yourself, if you're not walking with the Lord, is this working? Maybe you're rich, you're successful, and everyone else thinks you're cool, but do you have inner turmoil because you're trying to find happiness in all the wrong places? Well, I wanna tell you today that you were created by God and you will always feel empty until you are living for Him, until He fills you. And then the joy that is there is uh, mind-blowing and it's real and it'll get you through tough seasons. And if that's a decision you wanna make, I wanna give you an opportunity for that. So if everyone could just close their eyes. If you are a Christ follower, pray for those in the room that are not. And if you're not yet a Christ follower, just consider if you would like to follow Jesus, and it means repenting of your sins, turning from your sins, but if you would like to make a decision to commit your life to Jesus today, raise your hand, and I just wanna lead you in a simple prayer that you can pray. Awesome. Great. If you're watching online, do this and then let the person in the chat know or give me a call tomorrow in the office who can talk about it, anyone in the balcony. If you'd like to follow Jesus, just raise your hand. Those of you that have raised your hand can express a prayer like this. It doesn't, doesn't have to be like this, but as, as long as you're sincere about your decision, then I believe God will honor that. You can say, Father in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner and I, I need your salvation. Forgive me of my sins. Save me from them. I believe Jesus is God, that he lived a perfect life, died on the cross for me, and rose again three days later. Make me a new creation and give me the strength to follow after you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for those of you that have done that, we wanna celebrate with you.
but it's not, a, it's not a casual decision. And so please come forward and tell our prayer team. We have a Bible that we wanna give you. If you text the word journey to that number we're always talking about, we will answer your questions. We will send you links to short Bible studies to tell you what's prayer all about? How do I read the Bible? How do I have assurance of my salvation? How do I get baptized? And next week we're having baptisms here and it's not too late to sign up. So go on our website and sign up for the baptisms. But God bless you guys and we'll see you next week.